And when you mentioned, you know, there was no real defining moment, mm. there was, um, cause it's really interesting. We've had, you know, a lot of people speak about this one moment. Mm. Uh, some people say, you know, just like yourself, that there wasn't a defining moment. It was just kind of like this feeling, but you mentioned that, you know, the pain was, was more was more painful to to stay the same yeah. than make a change what what was that feeling like because that must have been a different kind of feeling what kind of pain were you were you feeling at that time i mean when you're in active addiction uh you know i i just felt like i had no worth whatsoever I mean, uh, you, and also I think, um, you know, it's such a taboo sex work as well, you know. Uh, uh, it is a taboo. Yeah, and and I think... So thank you for sharing that part yeah. of your journey. No, I think it's really important, you know, and for me, I, I, I will talk about often as prostitution. For me, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't sex work because it wasn't a job. I'm sure there are lots of people, people, um, you know, doing cam work and stuff like that, and, you know, definitely it's sex work for them. For me, it was prostitution at it, at, you know, at its very lowest level, standing on a street corner, that doesn't do a lot for your self-esteem. Uh, and at that time, I just felt like I was worthless, had nothing to offer, had no skills, had nothing to give. And after a while, I began to think, this is just it. This is just, this is how my life is going to be. So actually getting to that point where I thought, actually, yeah, I can change. I think I can change. You know, and there was huge amounts of fear involved. And and I think for lots of people who've been through this system, if it's it's safer not to try because if you don't try, you're never going to fail, are you? Sure. Um, you know, it takes some courage, a different type of courage. You know, you need a certain type of courage to get into a car with a stranger on a street corner on a dark night somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, but it's a different type of courage to actually say, no, I am worth this. I'm worth better. I can do something with my life so what gave you the courage then <sighs> do you know that's a really good question and i still don't think i've pinned it down i do think the employment i think um i, I think that was a key part in it but it was just my life was miserable you know it was get up go out grafting score take the drugs go out grafting score take the drugs it was just never ending uh misery and i could kind of see you know, for, for uh, I could kind of see the damage that it was doing. You know, it was the ripples in the pond. I could see how that was hurting my family. Uh, you know, there was a period of time when it, it didn't matter and I was kind of blind to that and, mm. you know, did a lot of things I was ashamed of, you know, stole from my family, did a lot of those things to, to maintain an addiction, cut off friends and family, rip people off, did all those sort of things that you do. And there was just some clarity that was coming. Maybe we're getting older that I could really see how that was hurting people. And you see how people's lives are moving on. You know, my sister got married. She had a she had a daughter. They didn't really want me around the daughter, you know, because mm. I would probably go and rob my sister's handbag when I was at the house. So, you know, there were parts of society, you know, and community and family that I wanted to be a part of, but I couldn't with that addiction. Mm. And my family were very supportive. They always said, you know, we're not giving you any more money. You know, we're not going to do that. We're not going to support this addiction. But if you are ever serious about coming off, come back and we'll help you. Wow. That must have been really yeah. good to have. There. Yeah, I, I ignored that for about 15 <laughs> years. <laughs> but but it, just knowing that but, and then yeah. reaching the feeling that you said you reached yeah. must have, you know, been that that yeah. inner drive to really but you've just listed so many things that come into play with um with the the journey you were on you know it's not just about how you were feeling it's like the whole world around you was kind of like suffering with you you know yeah. um and i'm i'm lucky because i had that family support i mean lots of people who mm. don't have that family support and that must be absolutely devastating for people coming out of prison and wanting to make that change and wanting to do something with their life and doing that alone that's very difficult i mean i i, I remember talking to, to to some women recently about uh christmas and uh, you know this uh christmas in prison really tough time mm -hmm. and um you know, talking to people and, and saying, "Don't." For me, Christmas in prison was actually better because my family didn't want me there at Christmas. I would have done something awful. I would have ruined everybody else's Christmas. So at least I got a Christmas of some sort in prison where I would get a meal. I wouldn't have to go to some kind of homeless shelter or something like that. Mm. Um, and and I think it's the journey afterwards as well. There's lots of kind of behaviours uh, that are attached to kind of or were for me having an active addiction. Um, you know that I, I had to kind of train myself out of li lying. You had to unlearn them. I had to unlearn them. That's exactly it. Lying. I had to unlearn lying. I would have lied to you. 
yeah, I would have told you that I'm wearing a white shirt if I felt it could have got me a bag of drugs or a rock or, mm -hmm. a, or a bag of gear. I would have done that, you know, 100%. And actually, Such a big mind shift, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Just really thinking, I don't have to do that. I don't have to manipulate people. I don't have to look for weaknesses in people. Mm. I don't have to do that anymore. I'm not in those circumstances. How did it feel when you officially knew and officially, yeah, officially knew you were never going back? And that was not your life anymore. Yeah, I, it was a great feeling. I'm not sure if there ever was an official feeling because I think even now I look at people uh, and I think they're, but for the grace of God, you know, I think good people make really bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those decisions are born out of poverty or born out of trauma. So uh, I think, is it one of the housing um, like crisis or shelter? They always say you're only one or two paychecks away from from homelessness, yeah, and I yeah. often think of that about the criminal justice system. Sometimes you just one bad decision that could be born from any of those things, particularly mm. now with the, the, the you know the the cost of living crisis. Good people make bad decisions, you yeah. know. We say I that mean, a lot, you know. We say that a lot that it could be one mistake, one error, yeah. one decision, one moment that can change your yeah. whole life. And anybody, everyone is susceptible to that. Absolutely, you know. So it's about how do we put things in place, or how do we support people when they're trying to make that change yeah. and trying to. Yeah. come out of the things that and they, when it's they not do. linear yeah you know when yeah. people when people are doing really well because i think people uh, people who've experienced addiction um we are you know i was a queen of self sabotage you know if anybody wants to write a program about self sabotage please do and deliver it in prisons <laughs> because you know i would get to a certain point and i would do really well and i see it with people that i work with now in my role do really well and then i'd think no nah, i'm going to fail at this at some point you know what I mean? i'm going to mess this up so I would self-sabotage and use again. And I did that in the journey. You know, when you were asking me before, mm. what was that like? You know, um, I did that quite a few times, that stop, start, stop, start. Okay. Don't really deserve this relapse again. Mm -hmm. Or I would kid myself, yeah, yeah, you can use drugs socially. You know what I mean? We, I know I can't use drugs so socially. So it's like an ongoing yeah. healing process. Yeah. But yeah. you kind of knew deep, deep down that this is what you had to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely. hard. That's tough as well, isn't it? It's yeah. a journey on the way out as yeah, well. But yeah. I can relate to that mindset. Mm. Of, you know, you need to make a change. Yeah. But do I? Do I yeah. have to? Maybe yeah. I could ride it out a little bit longer. Yeah, and you know you're going to shed things on the way. You know you're going to shed all those associates who you used to have a good laugh with and go out grafting with and sit around drinking with and sit around taking drugs with. You know yeah. you're going to lose all that, mm. you know, whilst that might be um, not helpful, that weird toxic community, it's one that you're safe with, That you know, that safety within that group. Now I've got to go out and meet loads of new friends and acquaintances and I've got to convince them that me with a with a with a you know an ex drug user with a criminal record it was also a prostitute I've got to convince them that I'm worth being mm. friends with or I'm worth employing or I'm worth any of those things that's where the fear really came into it I but think. the right people you wouldn't have to convince right yeah 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 so you know I know you mentioned working into a, like working at a supermarket and then another place but how did you kickstart your career how did you get into those things I went to work, um, uh, how did I get that right? I remember it was, a, a, I'd come out, I'd done detox. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd done detox about six times, I think, actually. So um, and I came out and um, actually I had a really good probation officer. I had lots of bad probation officers, but I had this one great probation officer who said to me, um, look, he said, you know, what you can do is you can tell me the truth or you can just lie to me for the next six months and I don't know, it was like a light bulb went out. Oh, my God, telling him the truth. That's a really novel approach. I never thought about telling him, <laughs> telling him the truth, you know. I was really just interested in the past about ducking down, but I did tell him the truth. And, How you old know, were you, sir, at this stage? Oh, God. Uh, well, I'm 60 next year, so, you know, 35, 36, something like that. So he managed to reconnect me with my family, you mm -hmm. know. He said, why don't you just ring him up, you know. And I thought, oh, I've been estranged too long, you know what I mean gone down a road they didn't want me to go down. He said, why don't you apply for a job? And I thought, oh, I can't apply for a job. And they were they were asking for Christmas staff. And I applied for this job and then they kept me on after Christmas. And I thought, yeah, I can do this. And then, of course, you get used to getting up in the morning. Yeah. God, I was exhausted for the first three months, you know, getting through Christmas and getting up at six o'clock in the morning, half six to stack shelves and stuff like that. But I felt good about me. I felt like I had purpose and reason and that I was valued and that I was... Uh, worthwhile, you know, and, but like I say, I realised very quickly, didn't want to work in retail. So did some volunteering, then went to work for this social housing yeah. charity. And that was really the route, having a, a great organisation that, that were able to support me. And I would say the same about the organisation I'm with now, you know, being able to support people with lived experience, 
That's my role now around co-production, making sure that uh, people with lived experience are involved, you know, not just in a box ticking way, yeah. but making sure that they're really involved in the design and the delivery of our services and that they're compensated that. Lived experience seems to be the only experience you don't have to pay for. So, uh, you know, making sure that if we're asking people questions and, and we're getting them involved, that they're being compensated for that. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about Women in Prison. What was that, what, what was so inspiring about this organisation? Oh, well, I think for me it was about Chris Tchaikovsky, really. You know, that she she is, um, she was a, a character by all accounts. I, I never got to meet her Um and what she did, I think it was a time then uh, when when women in prison started 40 years ago that there were lots of radical organisations coming through, you know, people like Clean Break, Hibiscus, all mm -hmm. those organisations really with these radical, radical roots. And Chris was, you know, really radical. I think I... I had a story from one of the trustees that, you know, she used to wait outside Parliament, outside the House of Commons, until she saw the MP she wanted to talk to and then she'd get in the taxi with them. He'd get in one door, she'd get in the other door and she wouldn't get out until he'd listen to her, you know, so wow. had these taxis just driving round and round Parliament Square. The moves you have to make. <laughs> Absolutely. Serious. I don't know if you could get away with that now. No. But, I mean... But, so but, she, yeah. I think, you know, mm. just that, um, those, those organisations with those really, really radical roots, for me, you know, that was what interested me. It's also a feminist organisation. You know, we are, I think, you know, there's a lot of kind of conversation about what being feminist means. You know, I think the very virtue of that, that we are women working for other women yep. and we are providing care, that's feminist itself in nature. You know, let's not get too wrapped up in what being a feminist is. But that's definitely what appealed to me. Chris and that focus on on supporting women uh, and, and, and that lived experience of Chris, of mm. radical Chris Tchaikovsky. That's a story. That's yeah. a story we're gonna we're gonna remember. Um, yeah. How long have you been in uh, this organisation now? Oh gosh, I think it's coming up to fifteen years now. I think so, and I've been really lucky in that I've um, been able to manage uh, a number of different projects. I've run projects in courts. I've run projects in police custody suites. Um, you know, I've got a project now, a national project, which is supporting women uh, with domestic, um, who've experienced domestic abuse and that runs across seven prisons. And my role is around co-production. We also have a lovely magazine that uh, I help to co-produce that goes out to all of the women's prisons nationally. So That's I'm great. really lucky that I've been able, um, you know, to find those different opportunities. But also the fight's not over, is it? You know, we still have a huge women's uh, population um, and, uh, you know, self-harm is at an, an mm. all-time high in women's prisons, nine times higher than in men's prisons. I was going to ask you, what are the main issues that you see um, see for women in prison? Self-harm, self-harm. That's just huge, you know. It women is make up, don't they? Three percent or five percent of the prison population, and they yeah. count for nearly half of all self harm. I mean, that's incredible. I'm not surprised because yeah. when I was in, it was <clears throat> the first thing that yeah. you know I saw all the time, and I saw a lot of, and I wasn't used to that. To be fair, yeah. I really wasn't. So it's really sad. It's really, yeah. um, quite shocking. Yeah. So I think what we see now is self harm. We see huge. Uh, levels of poor mental health in prison. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's the same main and, and female estate. But obviously, I only work in the female estate. So lots of people. If you didn't have a mental health issue when you went in prison, you probably, probably develop. You probably develop one. You know, depression, anxiety, something oh, and, like and that. And it varies on the scale as well. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And lots of that leads to self harm and the mm -hmm. guilt that comes, particularly for mums being separated from children. As I said before, that's huge. That does nothing, you know, to improve your mental health. Um, so yeah, trauma. I'm making it sound absolutely awful, and actually it is. You know, no, trauma, you're just giving us the real picture, health, right? Yeah, trauma, mental health, all of those sorts of things. Still seeing it. all the stuff Chris was talking about 40 years ago. We are still talking about it now. So that's what keeps me going. It's a great organisation. I love working for them, but the fight's not over. You yeah. know, I go into a prison every Friday, and I see the women who are still experiencing the same things that I was experiencing 24 years ago, and that Chris was experiencing 40 years ago. And the fact that women aren't uh, women in prison, you know, they're they're a minority, like I say, a very small percentage. And let's face it, prisons are designed by men for men. Okay, we don't have a criminal justice system that's designed for women. If you're a man and you commit a crime and you get a community sentence, there's loads of kind of programs, you know, that are written for men. Think first, all those propagation programs, victim yeah. awareness. Yeah. There aren't any that are written for women, specifically for women. Now, if we know that women offend differently, they have different routes into criminality and different routes out, why are we using the same programs? It, it, it just makes sense. Yeah. Create something for women by yeah. women. Yeah, absolutely. That will support women. And help women. 
Well yeah. said. I think we should put that. Put that. Yeah, somewhere. you ever thought of going that... into politics? I vote <laughs> yeah, for we, you. <laughs> wait, we always say this, but he's yeah. out. He's yeah, not, he's but not I involved. don't believe in politics. But um, that's a whole other discussion. Yeah. But yeah, no. But it will make sense to to have yeah. things that are designed specifically for women. And that's it, yeah. because we have that opportunity, down, and don't we, with the Lord Chancellor making this uh, making this uh, announcement about yeah. the Women's Justice Board, we have an opportunity to pilot something that then could be replicated across the male estate. Yeah, we can do it because there's only three thousand women. Can't do it with the mm. you know those huge yeah, numbers of men. Odd. But we can do it. We could pilot something that's really significant that takes into account, um, you know, why people are offending in the first place. Because I've never met anybody who's you know says, well, "Oh, I'm going to do something today that's going to get me sent to prison." You know, so just the underlying issues. Yes, exactly. So we need to be looking at that, and those are the things that um, you know all of these kind of great organisations do support people with that they you know they don't have a focus on then they're not being measured against reducing reoffending. You know they. They have other measures that so outcome driven measures that they're looking at how they can support people, what the support that people need, you know, because we we want to listen to what people coming out of prison say to us, you know, we that they say, I need this, I don't need this, I don't need that. It's tailoring, actually, tailoring, tailoring that support. That's it, that yeah. bespoke service. Yeah. Well, hopefully, very soon to come. And I like this plan as well. Um, I mean, your life is very different. To how it used to be. Yeah. You also said to us um, before we recorded this that, you know, you found that lifestyle quite exciting. Yes. We both want to know what excites you now. Yeah, that's 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 good. Yeah, because that lifestyle was exciting, you know, the going out and everything, being at crisis point, that heightened anxiety that you're talking about uh, and coming off drugs. Uh, was quite boring, actually. Yeah, I used to go home and argue with my boyfriend at the time just to create a bit of drama. Uh, now, my I have to say lots of things excite me. I've got a daughter now. I find uh, I find just spending time with her very exciting. And I think sometimes it's about finding those small pleasures in life. Uh, but work excites me, definitely. Being able, to, being able to work with people who are going through the same things that I've experienced being able to support those people effectively. And actually, the most important to me is getting those voices heard so that women's voices are heard uh, because they are hidden. You know, and that's the problem, isn't it, with our society, that the most vulnerable and marginalised of people are the ones who are left unheard. So it's great, you know, and they wouldn't be heard if it wasn't for things like Life After Prison podcast. Oh. So it's fantastic. I'm so chuffed to be here today. Oh. This excites me today. There you go. <laughs> we, love we love that. Thank love you that. for sharing all of that. Yeah. And thank you for, for being here and um thank you. And yeah, having having your voice heard. So that's that's really special to us. Thanks. Yeah. Thank uh, you so much. No. Nah. Um you know, I've you've you've mentioned quite a bit that, you know, the challenges and difficulties that you went through you still see today, right? What could be put in place to change that then? Oh, blimey. Gosh, um, I think, um, uh, you know, funding for women's centres, uh, so for women in the criminal justice system, those women's centres in the community, the national network of women's centres, they are all struggling to find funding. So I think if the government committed to some kind of funding for women's centres, you know, if you, most women now won't see their probation officer at probation office because probation officers are full of men, they'll see them at their local women's okay. centre. So um, actually funding for women's centres... Let's end remand, okay? If we're, you know, we're serious about reducing the prison population. Let's end remand, you know what I mean? Except for those circumstances where really the community needs to be protected. Let's end remand. Uh, let's stop those short sentences. They've done it in Scotland. You know, we're looking mm. at those uh, not sentencing people for 12 months or less. I do a lot of work with magistrates, you know, and they all say to me the same thing. You know, I didn't become a magistrate to send people to prison, but somebody's sending people to prison. Somebody's doing it. You know, we still have this huge prison population that's increasing time and time again. You know, we really need to be doing that work with people in communities, looking at the reason why they're getting involved in the criminal justice system, why they're offending in the first place, really addressing those root causes. By the time people are coming out of prison, the damage has been done, mm. you know, and the damage was done before and going to prison creates more damage for mm -hmm. women, men, families, communities. Mm -hmm. There's nothing good about that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm really hopeful uh, you know, because of this this announcement by by the Lord Chancellor this week, that actually we might start to see some change. I'm not holding my breath. I've heard similar things, but I'm hopeful. Maybe you need to go into politics. <laughs> Do you know what? Yeah, that really spoke to me. And I was just thinking, you know, we've heard um, 
Well, we were, I've been worried to be fair, you know, with the early release of prisoners that there wasn't any other kind of plan in place. Um, but what we've just heard, it, it feels like we are starting to possibly yeah. move in the right direction and get some answers of the, of the bigger picture and not just yeah. the short term, short term fixes. Um, but the way you said that was much better. <laughs> it was brilliant. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And carry on the great work. Cause just, <laughs> you know, you're amplifying people's voices, that voice of lived experience. And that's so, so important, you know, for people who will be inside listening to this or people who are struggling, you know, maybe they've been out a week, maybe they've been out a year and life hasn't panned out how I, I, I thought it would. Keep going. You know, I would say to people, you've oh. got this. You know, it's not linear, but you've got it. You can get through this. You've got this. Yeah. Come on. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, what we like to do on Life After Prison is signpost organisations that can support people in their journey of life after prison. Are there any organisations that you'd like to spotlight? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think if you are pregnant in prison, I would say Birth Companions, amazing organisation. So definitely I would try and link up with Birth Companions. If you're a foreign national, Hibiscus, doing amazing work. Clean Break for women after they've left prison, being able to link in with Clean Break. And also I would say... Um, you know, I mean, I could sit here and reel off all of the organisations nationally. Anna Wim, which is in the Midlands, Together Women, which is in Yorkshire. Uh, if you're a woman, I would say find out where your local women's centre is. Mm. Find out where it is because they will be the ones who will have the local knowledge. OK, so we're talking about local solutions for local problems and we'll be able to support you. And actually, I understand it sounds a little bit intimidating. I'm going to have to go and sit in a centre with loads of women. Nobody wants to do that. Are we all going to have to sit in a circle? Go and find your local women's centre. They'll be able to help you. Thank you for mentioning those. And we'll make sure that all those organisations will be in the show notes. Um, so to social media now, we actually asked you guys a question. We asked you guys, let me get my phone out because I want to get read out some responses here. So we asked you guys, how, uh, how did prison change your life for the better? And uh, I'm going to read out a few responses that we got. So this person says, first person said, had uh, reality checks of a lot of people inside who knew me and I knew I didn't want to be in there. So that's how prison helped this person. Another person said, um, more thought about how my actions affect others. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that we hear a lot. that's a brilliant a one actually a lot of yeah. time. Yeah. time to reflect time to reflect yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the last one I'm going to share is uh, and this is a really good one I like this one uh, I started my open university degree I completed my first year inside and got a 91 distinction Come way on. to go isn't it way to go absolutely there is life after prison yeah definitely uh, and so you, in prison and in prison too uh, so yeah if you want to um, you know respond to that and give us your thoughts on that question how did prison change your life for the better please get in touch with us you can do this on instagram and x at after prison pod uh, and on tiktok it's life after prison pod uh, you can also drop us an email at podcast at prison radio uh, and if you're listening on npr you can contact us through the usual methods that you know yeah so a massive thank you to Kate for joining us today. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thank you, man. Dropped being, a lot of gems. Yeah, <laughs> and being incredible. Um, I'm, I'm amplifying women's voices Potentially too. going into politics as well. <laughs> 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 a massive thank you to you guys for listening and watching. And we'll see you next time. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe too. Take care. <laughs>